Um, but I'm sure it will. <laughs> My name is Lisa Hella. I'm uh, part of the Department of German and Scandinavian here, and I am happy to introduce our three presenters of this mid-morning panel here. Um, the panel is called Cynicism and Irony in TV, TV and Film, and our first presenter will be Sean Bray. Sean is a second year MA student in uh, German studies at the University of Colorado Boulder, and his re research focuses on notions of the human in the period immediately following World War II, drawing on perspectives of critiques of science and technology, critical race theory, and gender studies. To date, he has primarily worked with East German film, particularly the works of direct, director, director? <laughs> uh, Kurt Metzig. He is currently preparing a thesis examining the construction of race and gender in GDR film, uh, tentatively titled, A Still Modern Future, Racialized Genres of, human, of the Human in Kurt Metzig's Der Schweigende Stern. And today, Jean uh, will be talking to us about the uh, an anti-fascist Führer ideologies of convenience in Ernst Telemann's films. Please join me in welcoming Jean. I'm gonna turn this on. Thank you, Lisa, and the U of O in general for for having me. Um, I guess I'll just jump right into it. So, in 1955, Otto Grotewald, the first prime minister of East Germany, wrote that film could become in the GDR an art which serves the democratic development of our people. Great East German films would, quote, reckon with the past and direct our gaze to a new and better future. One such film, he wrote, was a wonderful color film titled Ernst Thälmann, Son of His Class. The second film, titled Ernst Thälmann, Führer of His Class, would be released later that same year. And I think this image can almost give my presentation for me in terms of the cynicism and sort of the irony of an anti-fascist film venerating a Fuhrer, but I'll give the talk nonetheless. Both films experienced widespread and enthusiastic acclaim from the political elite. Wilhelm Pieck, the president of the GDR at the time, proclaimed the film to be a model for peace-loving people of all countries who honor and love Ernst Tillmann. Johannes Becker, at the time the Minister of Culture, called it a national heroic epic and a masterful depiction of one of the most glorious chapters in the history of the German workers' movement. Kurt Metzig, the film's director, called the film absolutely terrible, a film you can no longer watch today, and a film which he was ashamed to have made. So in this paper, I want to examine the Telemann films as emblematic of cynical cultural production, despite the uncynical depiction of ideology present in the films. I'll begin with a discussion of political cynicism, drawing on Sloterdijk's approach in his critique of cynical reason, and I'll examine the relation between cynicism and ideology, laying the groundwork for a discussion of the political cynicism and filmic cynicism of the Tillman films. With these concepts in mind, I'll look at the context of the film's production. First, the political mission of GDR film in general, and then specifically the asynchronism between Metzig's artistic approach and his part in producing these films. Finally, I'll look at the film itself, considering the extent to which the films borrow from fascist aesthetics despite their nominal anti-fascism. In sum, these steps will help illustrate what we might call an ideology of convenience. That in creating an anti-fascist film glorifying the Fuhrer of his class, the party leadership demonstrated the extent to which their cultural policies were aimed at replacing rather than overcoming the Nazi dictatorship. Now, beyond his definition of enlightened false consciousness, Sloterdijk offers a perspective of cynicism which is oriented in the sphere of politics. In the East, writes Sloterdijk, the world falls into two separate dimensions, end quote. These dimensions can be roughly identified as reality and ideology, a split in which the state maintains adherence to socialist values and ideals, despite the stance belonging only to a purely rhetorical version of socialism. Rather than actualizing any utopian possibilities, the state utilizes the rhetoric of socialism for cynical hegemonic purposes. Soderdijk writes, the, world, the word socialism, which everywhere else in the world delineates a hope for people to become masters of their own lives, has frozen into a symbol of futility. This highlights a particular form of state cynicism which developed in the Eastern Bloc, namely that the state founded with revolutionary intent failed to actualize these policies in society. Now, it's important to understand that Sloterdijk is writing 30 years after the release of the Telmon films. 
and his prognosis of East German society is predicated on the period closest to the collapse of the GDR. In the 1950s, before the creation of the Berlin Wall, um, the possibility of a socialist future would likely have still felt achievable for many people in the GDR, and directors like Metzig certainly believed it was. But the, quote, cynical disturbance of apocal proportions that the GDR became is presaged by the cynicism of productions like the Telmann films. Cynical production is marked by the lack of distinction between reality on the one hand and the ideo ideological mask on the other. As Zizek puts it, cynicism recognizes the distance between the ideological mask and the reality, but still finds reasons to retain the mask. In other words, productions may be cynical despite of, or even because of, their ideological trappings. In examining the Telmon films, we should take them not at face value, but rather examine them in context, attempting to find the line between the ideological mask and the reality of their production. And in so doing, we reveal the underlying cynicism of a set of films which are themselves deeply uncynical. The history of East German cinema, writes Sebastian Hajdushka, is convoluted and complicated, full of paradoxes and contradictions, and the delineation between ideology and reality is one such contradiction. In describing the production of the Telmann films, Metzig referred to a Stalinist cultural policy. They were the only films which he made on demand rather than bringing to the studio independently, and politically the film served an explicit role for the party leadership. They should guide the way for socialist thought in the nascent country. Their production was guided in accordance with ideological mandates intended to create a positive hero from whom the people of the GDR could learn proletarian class consciousness and the teachings of Lenin and Stalin. Indeed, such initiatives went far beyond just film. In the school system of East Germany, for example, they also built and maintained heroic myths around figures like Telmann. And in effect, these idealizations were intended to inculcate love of the fatherland and the national fathers. Again, this near deification of individual Marxist figures serves as a stark separation from the ideological mask. As Russell Lemons points out, Marxist-Leninist historians insisted that the working classes had made the history at the heart of the anti-fascism myth and tended to downplay the necessity of so-called great men. Despite this ideological stance, however, the filmmakers and officials in charge of the creation of the Telmann films knowingly pushed for a narrative which transformed Telmann from an individual member of the working class to a singular leader and great man. Before I go further, I do want to note that in talking about the totalitarian aesthetics of the Ernst Telmann films, it should be noted that DEFA, the East German film studio, and UFA, the Nazi film studio, differed fundamentally in their approach to politics and art. As Eric Rentschler points out, the majority of Nazi UFA films were not overtly political in nature. Instead, quote, ideology more often than not came sugar-coated in gripping, engaging, and pleasant packages of entertainment. And I can pause here at the risk of losing time for other things to note that Rentschler connects this directly to Sloterdijkian notions of cynicism, and we might also connect this with the discussion from the last panel on open and closed hegemony. The Nazis wanted the feeling that you were resisting without actualizing that into real, meaningful resistance. In DEFA films, by contrast, politics were characteristically put front and center, as the party line viewed political film as fundamental to the education and enlightenment of the masses. To quote Daniela Berkhan, the resultant didacticism of many DEFA features makes them in many respects the very antithesis of the products of the Nazi dream factory. The predominant function of DEFA films in this period was anti-fascist resistance. The didacticism which Berkhan highlights was directed towards the goal of educating and de-radicalizing a formerly fascist populace, reckoning with the past and orienting society towards a socialist future. And from the very first DEFA film, the studio worked nearly singularly towards anti-fascist narratives. And in many cases, these are actually among some of the most complex reckonings with the legacy of fascism and the realities of fascist oppression coming out of the 40s and 50s. Film Sterna, for example, acknowledges Jewish persecution, the concentration camps, and the Shoah itself. Metzig's first film in 1947, Marriage in the Shadows, was the first German film, or among the first German films, to acknowledge the specifically anti-Semitic dimension of Nazi ideology. So those are films which I would argue are not cynical. They are what they claim to be. But that only tells us that this goes even further when we're looking at the Ernst Thälmann films, that there is something happening in these like aberrant, cynical productions. Um, and so Ernst Thälmann specifically should be seen as what Sloterdijk calls rhetorical socialism. That is a cynical production which knowingly violates its own ideological stance. 
Of this type of cynicism, Zizek writes, it is no longer meant, even by its authors, to be taken seriously. Its status is just that of a means of manipulation, purely external and instrumental, its rules secured not by its truth value, but by simple extra ideological violence and promise of gain. Ernst Thälmann does not take a stance of genuine ideological commitment, but rather utilizes the trappings of ideology to legitimate itself, in turn mythologizing its protagonist for political gain. On the level of the studio and the state, the cynicism should be clear. Here is an anti-fascist studio founded in an anti-fascist state, nonetheless invoking the aesthetics of fascism. And further, we can examine the role of Metzig himself in the film, revealing a type of politico-artistic cynicism in his production. This individual cynicism lies in the aesthetic principles which Metzig had elaborated shortly before agreeing to direct the films. In 1951, three years before the release of Son of His Class, Metzig wrote, Realistic art shapes living people. It is always vigorous, blutvoll. Schematic representations of the worker, the peasant, the capitalist, the saboteur are hostile and alien to art. Such schematic representations are unfortunately found in our scripts and especially in the mass scenes of our films. Here, the working masses are often portrayed as undifferentiated and uniform. So for Metzig, film should be driven by individuals, not types which reduce the living people to mere representations of a category. And while he specifically decries such representation in DEFA film, his description of schematism may be applied to fascist films like Triumph of the Will, which we should be familiar with from Aaron's presentation yesterday, where the German nation is depicted as a crowd lacking in individual properties, while Hitler is given a godlike presence through the use of close-up shots of him speaking. Indeed, Metzig further argues that such schematic representations serve a, quote, concrete class function in the interest of anti-humanist imperialism, suggesting that he views these approaches not as mere bad form, but rather as inherently dehumanizing and indeed anti-Marxist, anti-communist, anti-socialist, etc. But despite these artistic reservations, the films are rife with aesthetic schematism which contradicts Metzig's own principles. So the primary aesthetic form of the Telmon films as in Triumph of the Will, is the mass crowd scene. The individual characters largely serve as vehicles to progress the film between scenes of Tailman and other communist leaders addressing crowds who in turn offer either rapt attention or enthusiastic support. The individual human beings of the film are re reduced to aesthetic schema, mass types who are subordinated in turn to the great man, the Fuhrer of his class. And here we may think of Walter Benjamin's commentary on fascist aesthetics that, quote, the violation of the masses whom fascism with its fewer cult forces to their knees has its counterpart in the violation of an apparatus which is pressed into the production of ritual values. The film, rather than empowering the masses, subordinates them to a monumental vision. And Tailman, for his part, is neither lebendig nor blutvoll. He is not a human figure, politically powerful, but nonetheless vulnerable or flawed in some way. Instead, he becomes narratively and visually the fewer to whom the masses are subordinated. In Metzig's own words, they wanted to build a kind of monument of Tillman, a deification of process akin to what Benjamin calls the production of ritual values in film. Film should be, in Benjamin's thinking, an emancipatory art form, without the ritual value of non-reproducible mediums. In short, communism is meant to use film as something like a panacea for ritual values, while fascism violates the filmic apparatus to reify those same values. In these films, however, we see a synthesis of fascist aesthetics with communist ideology. The films aesthetically violate the masses in the name of an ideology which professes to emancipate them. And this synthesis, in fact, goes further, because in addition to their affinity with the Riefenstahl propaganda documentaries, the Telmon films invoke many of the filmic operations of the most overtly propagandic Nazi feature films, particularly Hitler Youth Quex. In Hitler Youth Quex, we see a type, and this should not be an image here, I know that that is blank. In Hitler Youth Quex, we see a type of fascist Bildungsroman. The boy finds himself in Nazism, joining the Hitler youth and sacrificing himself for the cause. In Ernst Telmann, we see largely the same transformation occur. Telmann begins the first film as a dock worker, but is spurred to political activity by a worker's strike in Hamburg. Through the first two films, he rises out of the masses to become the leader, the Führer, of the Communist Party, and is ultimately martyred, sacrificing himself for the cause in the fight against fascism. This narrative affinity is unified in the film's final sequences. In both, the protagonist's death is layered with the flag of their cause, invoking the transformation into a political property. In the final moments of Ernst Thälmann, we watch as he is led out of his cell by the Nazi guards. Framed in a close-up shot, he walks towards the camera, which continually tracks away from him. 
The framing emphasizes his stoic and determined countenance as he calmly approaches his death. We're meant to see the mythologized Telmon, a man who can calmly sacrifice himself without betraying any internal tumult. Further, Metzig utilizes a shallow depth of field to keep the Nazi guards unfocused in the background, in contrast with the focused vision we have of Telmon himself. Um, and we don't want audio for this clip, so I'll turn that off. Um, combined with Telmon's vocal assurance that a better Germany is coming, the effect is one of progress. He strides forward, guiding the way to a better future and obscuring the Nazi past in turn. As he walks, the guards in the prison behind him give way to a waving red flag, an effect which is heightened by the use of an Agfa color film stock which left muted greens but highly saturated reds. In this overlaid shot, the depth of field now brings both foreground and background into focus, collapsing Telmon and the red flag into a unity where before there was visual separation. A voiceover from Telmon tells us that the most precious thing a, a person possesses is life. It is only given once. And thus the audience is reminded of the gravity of his sacrifice. He gives up his most precious possession for the good of the cause. As the voiceover fades out, a political anthem fades in, and his body is not yet dead, but as in Hitler Youth Quecks, the sights and sounds of a party are brought forth by his sacrifice. So here we can see, again, the quality isn't particularly fantastic for the Hitler Youth Quecks scene. We can see this direct contrast happening, where in both cases, the protagonist becomes overlaid with the political symbol of the ideology. In Hitler Youth Quecks, writes Rentschler, he evanesces into a medium for a movement. Rather than a human subject, he becomes political property, a martyr for communism. The final sequence involves a celebration of death in which human sacrifice is experienced as aesthetic reverie. And I want to note here that there is a possible distinction to be made between Heine Fulker's transformation in Hitler Youth Quex and Ernst Thälmann's in the titular films. In Hitler Youth Quex, the protagonist is killed on screen, the death itself becoming an aesthetic evocation of fascist self-sacrifice. While in Ernst Thälmann, the moment of death is kept entirely off screen, being merely implied to occur after the shot fades to black. So at least visually, Thälmann himself doesn't die while you're watching the film. Mikhail Cechnohel, one of the film scriptwriters, explained this absence in 1955. We did not want to show it that way. We wanted to show the great truth, the Telmon's function and struggle in society today. The difference in Heine's death and Telmon's is thus completely congruent with fascist aesthetics because the Fuhrer type doesn't hear die, but instead passes into the figure of myth. The masses become, quote, human material, and the Fuhrer becomes eternal. Thus, in Ernst Thälmann, the consummate anti-fascist film, what is left is an aesthetics of fascism, a political cynicism in which the rhetoric of democracy and humanism serve as a mask for reality of what Russell Lemons calls fathers and fatherland. Referencing Sloterdijk, Rentschler writes, the confidence man and the cynic resemble the fascist politician, for neither believes in his own rhetoric, but rather recognizes it for what it is, the means to an end and a swindle. In the Ernst Thälmann films, we can see this gallery perhaps expanded to include the communist politician or at times the communist filmmaker. In many cases, Defo films did in fact practice what they preached, so to speak. In addition to the earlier anti-fascist films I mentioned, Metzig himself later directed I Am the Rabbit, a film which was banned for the way in which it critiqued the political operations of East German society. But it's exactly this somewhat chemical streak in Defa film and Metzig's overall body of work which only deepens the cynicism of the Telmann films. Far from a mere ideologue, Metzig was capable of films which actively question the ideological mask of the state. But in Ernst Telmann, we see a reinvigoration and evocation of fascist aesthetics, a set of films which make ideological claims to anti-fascism while actively reinforcing an authoritarian state. To be clear, the GDR never reached the totalitarian power of Nazi Germany. I don't want to imply that they did. But in the Telmann films, we see what Zizek calls a means of manipulation. The beginning of the separation of the world into Sloterdijk's two dimensions. The filmmakers knew what they were doing, and they did it anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, and uh, for this really insightful um, presentation on GDR 
and Führer parallels, I want to say. Um, now, we're doing it like we did yesterday, so we're doing first all three presentations, so just hold off on the questions, yeah, write them down, make sure you have them. Um, and then we will continue on now with Carolina Jäger. Um, Carolina Jäger is a first year doctoral student in the Transcultural German Studies program at the University of Arizona. She grew up in Tyrol, Austria, and graduated from the Pedagogical University Innsbruck in 2014. After spending two years as a language assistant in England and Switzerland, she was a fellowship recipient of the Robert Bosch Foundation. In this position, she lectured at the University of Science and Technology in Wuhan, China. In 2018, Carolina completed her master's degree at the University of Connecticut, where she wrote her master's thesis on intercultural competence in uh, the context of English, English language teaching in Austria. Um, Carolina's main research interest is in methodology and didactics and how intercultural competence can be taught in the foreign language classroom. And today, her talk is titled, I am a local, you idiot. Get lost, you flat country Tyrolean. An ironic representation of the self and other in Felix Mitterer's Piefkesage. Please join me in welcoming Carolina. Thank you for your very kind introduction. I am a local, you idiot. Get lost, you fled country Tyrolean. On ironic representations of the self and the other in Felix Mitterer's Piefke Saga. In the early 90s, the script of Felix Mitterer's Piefke Saga was adapted into a film. It depicts the complicated and conflicted relationship between Austrian people and German tourists visiting the Tyrolean Zillertal in a humorous and very satirical way. The dialogues of the main characters are peppered with allusions that are oriented towards prejudices and stereotypes of both countries. In the upcoming minutes, I would like to point out the importance of the stylistic elements of irony in the fictional, in the fictional dialogues and the emerging symbols of the Piefke saga. Before getting into the analysis of concrete examples within the film version, let me elaborate on the concept of the Piefke first. Not only does the term appear in the title, it plays an essential role throughout the whole film. As a lot of people outside Austria do not have a connection to the subliminal notion of the term Piefke, I'd like to elaborate on its meaning first. This term can be backdated to the beginning of the 20th century. It has become a symbol forced upon a whole nation and epitomizes the idea of all negative character traits that are imputed on Germans. These include arrogance, know-it-all attitude, as we call it in German as Spießigkeit, along with stinginess, stubbornness, and, of course, a lack of humor. After World War II, the contentious historical connection between Austria and Germany demanded a construction of new identification fields that express a sense of Austrian identity. The term Piefke has helped the Austrians in their effort to distance themselves from Germany and the German people. The Piefke saga is built upon this derogatory term and its implications on locals as well as tourists. For a better understanding of the analysis of the dialogues, allow me to summarize the content first. The first scene shows original excerpts from a Viennese TV show from 1982. Six out of nine Austrians indicate they would generally denominate Germans as Piefke. The mayor Wechselberger of the Tyrolean tourist town Lannenberg, as well as the German tourist family Sattmann, follow the show in their homes, and both are agitated, albeit for two contrary reasons. The Satmans are enraged by the disrespectful assertions, whereas the Tyroleans are concerned about the possible absence of the German tourists. 
After all, they are by far the major source of income for the little town. In an attempt to provide redress, the mayor extends an invitation to the Satman family to spend their holidays in Lahnenberg. After following the invitation, the situation doesn't calm down as various disagreements between locals and the tourists exacerbate the situation. Not least due to the cover of a Viennese newspaper with its title, Wer braucht die Piefke? Who needs the Piefke? The Satmans want to leave and try to stir other Germans into action to follow their example. The Austrians try to hamper the Germans' undertaking and get together for a meeting in the town hall. The film ends with an assembly in the local pavilion. On behalf of the local community, a small girl offers an apology and recites a poem. And that helps in the end to settle the dispute. In his dialogues, Felix Mitterer plays with the concept of nationality and citizenship. Through the demarcation from the self, the foreign, or the uncommon and unknown is being stressed upon. It serves as a target for stereotyping and quite strange hostilities. Whoever is restrained access to the group of locals will be de degraded automatically to an outgroup member. And Riley poses that this fact relates to two circumstances. The first is identity, and the second is the way in which identity impinges on forms of interactions. In other words, how do speakers go about categorizing their interlocutors as foreigners, and how does that perception influence interaction? The hierarchic positioning of the other is marked through um, language tools and the postulating of subjectivity through a linguistic spectrum. The Germans are left with the mark of the German and the Piefke. In return, they try to abdicate from those descriptions and to make themselves visible through depicting themselves. It is their attempt to gain social recognition from the Austrians. Being different is essential in this endeavor as only through the demarcation from the Nicht-Ich, the own consciousness, in our case, being German or Austrian, cannot be constructed. Mitterer plays with the stylistic element of irony in order to show these constructions, the subliminal, hidden connotations in the dialogues, as well as the symbols illustrate a type of misdirection and insofar an unvariable discourse. And according to Aristotle, yet another characteristic of irony is a latent veiled contempt, which Mitterer makes substantial use of. In this spirit, while analyzing his dialogues, we will draw attention to unmask the not explicitly said and the detection of hidden signification. For this purpose, let's have a closer look at an excerpt of the film. Karl Friedrich Sattmann, the head of the Sattmann family, learns about the meeting in the town hall, where the Austrians try to come up with a solution for the conflict and the imminent departure of their guests. So Satman employs another German tourist, his name is Mr. Kerner, to attend the meeting and to find out the locals' perspective undertakings. And so let's have a look in this particular scene. Do we have a tone by any chance? I think, I think you muted it earlier to see. So let's watch it nevertheless, and I will read it for you. <laughs> halt, nur für Einheimische. Bin Einheimischer Depp. Ja, du schon du. Grüß dich Gott, wie geht's da denn? Geh verschwind, du flachler Tiroler. Zupf dich. Zupf dich? We can see Joey, who denies access to Mr. Kerner. In his position of the doorman, 
he manifests his position of power and the tourist's inferiority. He clears the sides between we, the locals, and you, the foreigners. Kana's attempt to pass off as a native fails. It's not only true that due to the size of the town, the local population knows each other. Herr Kerner's accent reveals his nationality. Although he tries to use an insult that is mainly used in Austria and Bavaria, Depp, which is like an idiot, um, he doesn't manage to convince Joey to grant him admission. Herr Kerner doesn't resign and tries to position himself as an in-group member. Therefore, he tries to adapt to the local linguistic practice. He says, Grias die Gott, and you could really hear his German accent. His futile effort fails again, though. He cannot convince Joey of his self-ascribed identity of a genuine Tyrolean. We can see a distinctive divergence between the alleged exemplification of the self and the other of the German tourists. So Joey replies, Geh verschwind, du Flachland Tiroler. Get lost, you fled country Tyrolean. And his word choice is here clearly contemptuous. After all, the mountains are the Tyrolean flagship and trademark. Maybe Joey acknowledges Mr. Kerner's position as a tourist, who therefore plays a significant economical role for a tourism town. However, more likely, Mr. Kerner is being identified as a wannabe Tyrolean who indeed would like to be part of the community, but who is being denied any form of social recognition by his interlocutor, for flat country does not exist in Tyrol as such. And Joey adds fuel to the fire, Zupfti, which is a dialect um, expression for buzz off, fazidi. In doing so, Joey underlines once again that Mr. Kerner is demanded to leave. Ironically, the contrary purpose of the meeting is to come up with an idea on how to persuade the German tourists to remain. After all, the guests are responsible for profitable overnight stays, the main source of income. In this moment, however, Mr. Kerner is not allowed to stay. Evidently, he is confused and perplexed, and eventually he cannot decipher the Tyrolean dialect. His query, Zupfti, buzz off, indicates powerlessness. He needs to admit and accept that he is not capable of obtaining social recognition through his attempt to speak the local dialect. <clears throat> In this sequence, not only the dialogues, but also the use of names show the affiliation of the protagonists. Joey is being introduced with his first name throughout the whole script. In fact, it is not unusual that addressing each other using the German <coughs> informal Duzen is the preferred way of communication between locals. The villagers know each other and prefer to use the informal. Guests, however, are being addressed using the former form Sitzen. In this scene, Joey attains from using any formality and duzt the German tourist, Mr. Kerner. There is more symbolic power to names in the script. I would like to demonstrate this on two concrete examples. The first is Karl Friedrich Sattmann. His last name, Sattmann, can be interpreted in two ways. As a German citizen, he feels discriminated by the Tyrolians. Er hat es satt. So he's literally fed up with them and the situation. In one scene, Sattmann himself describes the Germans as a unersättliches Volk, an insatiable nation, when in the very next moment he ransacks the breakfast buffet. His family name insinuates that he is satt, saturated, and therefore modest and humble, not only regarding material things, but also in relation to social values. This modesty is being questions in, questioned in various moments in the script, though. 
His most notable counterpart is Mayer Franz Wechselberger. Um, as the name Wechselberger indicates, he is literally switching sides. He said Wechsel. His last name leaves no doubt to the, as to the irony of it, as he has to try to juggle the versatile interests of all locals, he finds himself forced to undertake opportunistic actions. He simulates acceptance and goodwill to the Germans, and as soon as they turn their back, he shows his true colors. He curses not only once, scheiß Deutsche, <coughs> crappy Germans. The last scene I want to look at is at the end of the movie. In order to pour oil on troubled water, the Tyrolians decide to apologize in public. In the very same moment that Karl Friedrich tries to convince his fellow countrymen to leave Austria, a small girl walks on stage and cites a poem directed to the Germans. And I think that's not working, so we'll just skip it and read it for you. Oh, my beloved German friends, you dear guests of our village, we are deeply sorry that one has harmed you. Believe, we love you. You're always welcome. Forgive the terrible shame that has come from a Viennese quill. On bended knee, we ask for forgiveness. Please do not forsake us. Listen to the stirring of your heart and be a merciful judge. So the mayor counts on the cuteness of the little girl that recites the poem. She describes the Germans as beloved and dear and merciful in comparison to all the negative character traits that are accumulated in the term Piefke. The benevolent features are supposed to convince the Germans to stay. Although the Tyrolians apologize for all possible inconveniences, they insinuate that the roots of the conflict are beyond their sphere of influence. And we can see that in this passage, dass man euch zugefügt hat Schmerzen, that one has harmed you. It implies that the culprit is anonymous. Through linguistic means, the responsibility is handed over to someone else. It is only later on that the Viennese journalists those who wrote the original article, who needs the Piefke, are supposed to be held accountable for the situation. Throughout the Piefke saga, the Tyrolians distance themselves from the Viennese in general and the journalists in particular. They mark them as outgroup members in order to show their solidarity towards the German, even if it's not sincere at all. The mayor states in one scene, Die Deutschen sind uns beim Arsch lieber als die Wiener beim Gesicht. So we would rather have the Germans butt in our face than come face to face with the Viennese. The girl going down on one knee is supposed to illustrate and stress how important the goodwill of the Germans is for the local community. The guests should witness that the Tyrolians are truly willing to accept the German superiority. They are ready to acknowledge the guests' economic power and to subjugate. The Austrians appeal to the generosity and the moral courage of the foreigners and explain that they are very sorry. Das ist ihnen leid tue, and in German leid tun is to feel harm, so they literally feel harm themselves. By doing this, the Tyrolians grant the Germans the version of their self, the one that they have wanted to be accepted. They gain social recognition uh, that they had longed for throughout the whole film. This scene makes us believe that the Tyrolians are truly interested in honest redress. Well, almost, because in the background of the scene, we can see a marching band and straight after the little girl finishes um, her poem, um, they start uh, performing a Trauermarsch, which is a funeral march. And so we can see the rather ironic stylistic element that Mitterrand has used here. 
These examples of the Piefke saga exemplify the amount of irony that Felix Mitterer has packed his script with. We are being asked to examine and decipher the dialogues as well as symbols in it. The question arises, to what extent does the Piefke saga part 2 to 4 play with irony in a similar way that part 1 does? Is it as prevalent or does the author change his style? And if so, what implication does this alternative approach have regarding the construction of the self and the other of the protagonists. In addition, Felix Mitterra challenges us to pause for a moment and to reflect on the German-Austrian relationship, not just on the surface, but to look at the deeper level, from human to human. In times where borders seem to be more important than human beings, this consideration is more vital than ever. Thank you. Thank you so much to our second presenter, Carolina. And uh, now to on to our final presenter, organizer, everything. <laughs> Mädchen für alles, as we would say, right, <laughs> in German. But um, so there is an extra applause, I think, we have to give just for Joscha for organizing all of this and doing this amazing job and making sure we have food and technical difficulties, trying to figure it out. You can't always beat the computers, we know that, unfortunately. Um, so, first of all, thank you, Yosha, for organizing. <laughs> you did a great job. And now to his other honors that I have here. Okay, Yosha is a third year PhD student in the Department of German and Scandinavian at the University of Oregon. And he came to Eugene after receiving his BA in Scandinavian Studies and English in 2017 from the University of Tübingen in Germany. When he is not organizing the Grad Conference, his research focuses on German literature of migrations, especially Bosnian-born author Sasha Stanisic. Stanis mm -hmm. okay. Further interests include translation studies, the concepts of anxiety, cynicism, and Stimmung, as well as Hermann Hesse and Søren Kierkegaard. Recently, he has started to consider literature of migrations and uh, conser uh, conversation with African philosophy. And his talk today, nonetheless, is titled Bojack Horseman, an example of cynicism in popular culture. Please join me in welcoming you. Okay. All I ever wanted was to be your friend, and you treat me like a big joke. You think I don't notice? Why don't you like me? Mr. Peanut Butter. No, tell me. Because I'm jealous. Of what? Diane? No. Of everything. Everything was so easy for you. Oh, and it doesn't for you. You're a millionaire movie star with a girlfriend who loves you, acting in your dream movie. What more do you want? What else could the universe possibly owe you? I want to feel good about myself, the way you do. And I don't know how. I don't know if I can. Now what you just saw was a character crying out for help. Someone who desperately wants to be happy and doesn't know how. In other words, you saw a scene from the Netflix original show, Bojack Horseman. Now, the show has just come to an end last month, and I'm still semi-heartbroken about that, but that's all the more reason for me to talk about it today, let alone the immensity of the show's display and use of cynicism, and that's why we're here. The show's titular protagonist, Bojack Horseman, goes through ups and downs, but the downs overwhelmingly prevail. So far, so unspectacular. But even when he's doing well, he is never happy. Bojack Horseman is a portrayal of a character frantically trying to be happy in a society that takes his happiness for granted. After all, he's a celebrity. The narrative of the show is framed, even embedded, in a cynical mindset. The promising concept, and we've heard a lot about it in the last two days, of cynicism can be found in Peter Sloterdijk's Critique of Cynical Reason, where the author paints a picture of society written by and deeply created cynicism. Throughout the 20th century, cynicism, he says, evolved into a mass phenomenon. Quote, the discomfort in the culture has taken on a new quality. It appears as a universally diffu diffused cynicism. 
Cynicism seems to be an unspoken attitude in the daily behavior of the average person and is used as a coping device. As such, it shouldn't come as a surprise that popular culture, especially starting with the beginning of the 20th century, is embedded in a cynical discourse. Slavoj Žižek writes in his book, The Invisible Remainder, that we can analyze the critical structure well, but we can still not break out of it. Now, the point of my analysis that can thus hope to make is that popular culture cynicism is ubiquitous, but in its ubiquity, it is simply accepted as status quo. And this analysis then at least strives to disrupt the status quo. I will do this in two hopefully logically sound steps. First of all, I want to show the cynical structure of the show Bojack Horseman, and then I want to analyze the cynicism that the titular character displays. But first, I want to give a couple of information on the show for those who don't know it. Bojack Horseman is a cartoon series created by Raphael Bob Waxberg that aired first on Netflix on August 22, 2014. The series has six seasons with 60, 76 episodes, the last just having, been, having aired last month. And it is set in a world, and you can see that in the um, little clip in the beginning, in a world in which human animals live in a society with humans. Most of the story plays in Los Angeles, specifically in Hollywood. Protagonist and anti-hero Bojack Horseman, as his name may give away, a humanoid horse. As the star of a 90s sitcom called Horsin' Around, Bojack spends his days watching the sitcom on tape, sitting at home, drinking beer, doing drugs. Since the sitcom got cancelled more than 15 years ago, Bojack has done nothing. His aim in meaningless life feels shallow to Bojack, and he is caught in a spiral of self-loathing, of anxiety, and insecurity. Now, as the show starts, Bojack has been trying to write his autobiography for more than a year, hoping to rekindle his former glory uh, and, in turn, find something that will finally ma make him feel happy. But he hasn't written a single word for his autobiography and has already spent the advance on the publisher. Therefore, his publisher makes him hire a ghostwriter. My analysis will include the first three seasons with a couple of quotes and examples from later seasons sprinkled in, because I still have to think some more about the last three seasons. Before diving into the analysis of Bojack Horseman, I want to briefly return to Peter Sloterdijk and his critique of cynical reason. As a guide to modern cynicism, it will give us theoretical foundation needed to spot and critically analyze the cynicism in our popular culture example. What exactly is cynicism then? We've heard a lot about it today, and I'm going to quote again Sloterdijk with the false enlightened consciousness. It's an enlightened mind that has the ability to look back at history and knows that simple optimism is just another illusion. Cynicism is a condition of disillusion. It is, so Sloterdijk, the modernized unhappy awareness. It does not seek new values, that it does not inspire hope for itself, quote, in the new cynicism, a detached negativity is at play that musters for itself, barely any hope, at best a bit of irony and pity. While the individual subject is indeed enlightened, knows right from wrong, and can think for itself, it doesn't act on it, because of the knowledge of optimism as illusory. Dare to think for yourself, but only if, it's, if, it is, if it is not too much to ask or too much of a bother. Sloterdijk's choice of words, detached negativity, make it clear that the negativity is an active choice, a recent decision. Sloterdijk sees the modern cynic as a melancholic who is able to control his depression well enough in order to still function as workforce in capitalism. Now, Bojack Horseman is an extreme within this concept of cynicism from Sloterdijk. While some characteristics still apply to him, others he has already transcended, like by an anxiety-filled hopelessness. As Ian Crouch writes in a review of the show in The New Yorker, the innovation of Bojack Horseman may be that it finds nothing funny in the bleakness of its world. Bojack's life isn't funny because it's miserable. It is simply both funny and miserable at once, and on different tracks. It is, he continues, remarkable for its insistent bleakness. Now, the bizarre premise of having a human animal as protagonist may, at first glance, make it hard to believe the seriousness and the depth that the series clowns storytelling in. At the same time, it makes it easier for the viewer to watch the series from a focalizing point that always keeps a certain distance, and I will return to that in a second. The show is able to tackle issues like mental health, anxiety, the search for happiness, and the lack thereof in greater depth, while being able to balance it with its humorous elements. Still, its anthropomorphism also makes it relatable. Show creator Raphael Bob Waxberg said in an interview, quote, I think our wacky animated world allows us wiggle room. We can go to these darker places because we're cutting them with these very silly jokes in this very silly world. More interestingly, however, he comments on the use of animals, and in particular, an animal as protagonist. Quote, it again creates the distancing effect a little bit. I think by making Bojack a horse, it allows us an audience to project themselves on him in a way that if you're looking at a picture of Will Arnett, you might not be able, yeah, you might not be able, uh, I might not be as inclined to. There does exist an odd universality to these animals. By making them more foreign, they become more relatable. 
Similarly, the voice of actor of character Mr. Peanut Butter, Paul F. Tompkins, recently said in a video, quote, despite it being said in Hollywood and being about anthropomorphic animals, I think that the struggle to figure yourself out is fairly universal. But more than that, the style of animation in combination with anthropomorphic characters is usually a hallmark of series, movies, and stories that clearly aim at children. Just think, again, we have here, is it called Zootopia? I want to say it's called Zootopia. We have Frozen, we have Cars, we have many Pixar movies and different movies that all go in this direction, that are all aimed at kids. These stories carry the thin connotations of happiness, positivity, happy ending. And we can see the same thing in Bojack's 90s sitcom, Horsin' Around, which he watches regularly. Just watch part of the intro of the show, I'm sure it will seem familiar to you in its, in its tone and its make. <laughs> Yeah, that name always comes as a surprise. <laughs> um, simply put, Horsin' Around is a parse prototype for a shared group of connotations. Quote, every line is either a bad joke or an unexpression of affection. Every problem is easily solved, and every lesson learned is simple, direct, and painfully obvious. The shallowness is interesting. On the one hand, it is a daily experience in a society that is driven by the strife for success and the isolation of the individual. And the setting of the show in Hollywood, a place where glory and fame are paramount, multiplies this effect. At the same time, it is an escapist fantasy on TV where the shallowness is actually the truth. Problems can be solved within 20 minutes. Everything is fine at the end. In the very first scene of the very first episode, Bojack himself says essentially that Albany one of his dry, plumbed, and politically incorrect metaphors. I, I think the show's actually pretty solid for what it is. It's not Ibsen, sure. But look, for a lot of people, life is just one long, hard kick in the urethra. Sometimes, when you get home from a long day of getting kicked in the urethra, you just want to watch a show about good, likable people who love each other. Where, you know, no matter what happens, at the end of 30 minutes, everything's going to turn out okay. You know, because in real life, did I already say the thing about the urethra? The implications are, of course, manifold, but the main one is that life as a kick in the urethra is inalterable. And this need for escapism that Bojack portrays, and that we portray by watching many of these sitcoms, is contrasted with the show's narrative strategy. Raphael Bob Waxbrook emphasized that, quote, a lot of these shows have a status quo that they keep bouncing back to. Just think of uh, Family Guy, Simpsons, South Park, all of these have kind of a status quo. One of the things we really wanted to do from the beginning, one of the things that made our show special from the beginning, is there's no snapback. At the end of every episode, the damage that is done retains, and the next episode will carry over the emotional story. It will carry over even literally. If someone punches a hole in the wall, the next time you see that wall, there's going to be a hole in it. The world doesn't get fixed automatically. This narrative decision necessitates character growth. It forces the characters to reflect on their flaws, forces them to try and become better people. But to get back to the point at hand, both talking animals and animation, and particularly both in combination, suggest certain narratives and character arcs. This is probably more highlighted by some of the names of major characters. We have Princess Carolyn, who is a pink cat who is Bojack's agent and ex-girlfriend. We have Mr. Peanut Butter, a yellow, yellow, yellow Labrador Retriever, Bojack's friend at times and sitcom rival. Both names seem very childlike and offer a constant point of ironic contrast to the overarching bleakness of the show's story. And this is only increased by the many animal puns made and characteristics shown and appear only a couple. Tell to the door! Let's go ride in the car! <laughs> Although we have all of these, the show only really takes a few minutes, at best, to make it clear that the bright colors and animated characters don't necessarily lead to, quote, trustworthy authority figures and happy endings. It's the very first scene in which Bojack is interviewed as a guest on a TV show. It is good to be here, Charlie. Sorry I was late to traffic. It's uh, really no problem. I parked in a handicapped spot. I hope that's okay. You parked in I'm a... sorry, disabled spot. Is that the proper nomenclature? Maybe you should move the car. No, I don't think I should drive right now. I'm, I'm incredibly drunk. You're telling me that you're drunk right now? Is it just me, or am I nailing this interview? I kind of feel like I'm nailing it. Yes. <laughs> so this is the very first scene of the whole series. Thus the show immediately contrasts all the connotations I mentioned earlier of the animation style and the use of anthropomorphism 
Undercutting all of these assumptions of happy, almost child-friendly world without swearing or any heavy topics, with an immediate force, it only takes Bojack Horseman mere minutes to, quote, show the dark reality under the smiling, happy people surface of familiar concepts, deconstructing and mocking it. In its deconstructed stead, it shows the other, the real and hurtful shallowness of society. In short, in its very first minutes, the show lets its cynical undertone surface, discernible for all to see. This first glimpse of cynicism then lays low shortly underneath the surface, always palpable, always ready to show its face. But because of the mixture of hilarious comedy, black humor, and very real misery it takes on its usual status quo, right there, except as a silent shadow looming over everything, influencing it. But still, the show makes it plainly obvious that within the cynical frame that the show is embedded in, an easy solution is impossible. This is mirrored by Bojack's continuous cycle of hitting rock bottom, getting better, only to hit rock bottom again throughout all six seasons. At the same time, the viewer constantly sees what Bojack does wrong, knows how he could, how he could do better, that's sort of like false enlightened consciousness. Bojack manipulates himself and others, drags himself and then comes down constantly. But in his brokenness, his misery, and the failure of his cynicism to act as a distancing tool from reality, Bojack portrays anxiety, depression, and unhappiness in a relatable way, thus putting the viewer in a dilemma where they are put on the spot, enlightened false consciousness or heartless condemnation. Examined more closely, however, this dilemma dissolves. The viewer is put in a situation where they are cynical either way. Be understanding and even empathetic with Bojack, while knowing what to do to get out of the misery, is the relaxed mindset of the enlightened false consciousness. But heartless condemnation, on the other hand, is nothing but a moral superiority in the viewer's own passivity while watching, and as such, unfounded in lived experience, and that's highly cynical in itself. Therefore, Bojack Horseman shows is inevitably embedded within the power of a cynical structure. It flatters the viewer by deconstructing the tropes they know, only to reveal the hilarious but wounded soul underneath, only to put the viewer in their place with its directness, immediacy, and brutal honesty. Let's take a step back and analyze the man and horse himself. Bojack Horseman displays the harshest and most clear-cut cynicism in the show. There seem to be many things wrong with him, too many for himself to understand. In the first episode, we see Bojack at dinner with his then-girlfriend, Princess Carolyn. She is breaking up with him, one of the reasons being his problems with commitment. His reaction? I'm not afraid of commitment. I commit to things all the time. It's the following through that commitment that I take issue with. Throughout the show, the viewer realizes how strongly that is the case, and its deep bitterness and truthfulness, his statement is cynical. So many of his commitments he doesn't follow through. He either forgets about them, thinks that other things are more important, or just flat out runs away. In the same episode, we see Bojack talking to the publisher of, auto of his autobiography. The publishing company is, is visibly struggling, and the publisher tells Bo uh, that to Bojack multiple times. And Bojack gets, out of uh, gets one more week to write the book, and he leaves the conversation saying, this book is top priority for me. The show then cuts ahead one week, and we see Bojack sitting on his couch in a robe, drinking beer, but he didn't just forget about it. Although he doesn't seem to understand the publisher's urgency, it is quickly clear why Bojack is so torn about the book. He emphasizes again and again that he wants to write, write it so that everyone can see what a great person he is, the real Bojack, as he always says, so that everyone can love him again. However, the reason why he's working on it is that he's afraid that there's no more to him, that he isn't a great better person. In episode 11, when the book is published and he's very unhappy with the honest but not always flattering depiction of him, he says to his agent, Oh, don't you get it? This is my last chance to make people love me again. If this goes out, everybody's going to see the real me. Now I spend a lot of time with the real me, and believe me, nobody's going to love that guy. And Diane does characterize him to a point in the book called One Trick Pony. Quote, he filled the air with words, terrified of silence, as one often who is smart enough to recognize his many personal failings, but unwilling or unable to take the steps required to fix them. Next to Diane's characterization, we come back to the enlightened false consciousness that really fits Bojack. In the second episode, he laments, you know what the problem is with everybody? They all just want to hear what they already believe. No one ever wants to hear the truth. But yet he's describing himself with that. He doesn't want to hear the truth. Because he already knows it, and he has buried it within him. Once he reads the final draft of the autobiography, he is very angry. But even more because he was hoping that Diane would see something in him that he isn't seeing, something positive and good. He confronts her, wanting to know whether she thinks that deep down, he's a good person. I, I guess my question is, do you... Do you think it's too late for me? What? I mean, am, am, am I just doomed to be the person that I am? The, the person in that book? I mean, it's not too late for me, is it? It's, it's not too late. Diane, I need you to tell me that it's not too late. Bojack, I I, I... I need you to tell me that I'm a good person. 
I know that I can be selfish and narcissistic and self-destructive, but underneath all that, deep down, I'm a good person and I need you to tell me that I'm good. Diane, tell me, please, Diane, tell me that I'm good. Around. So of course here we see we have this really traumatic emotional moment and immediately we have something on the cutting end. Now in the last episode of the first season, Bojack lucks, lucks into turn as it usually does towards the end of the season. He wins a golden cloak for his autobiography, remarking himself that the award people don't seem to understand what they're giving awards for, and then gets to audition for his dream role, playing the racehorse secretariat. In the long run, however, it does not give him what he's looking for. The fact that he is clinging to the Golden Globe in every single scene in this episode and aligns how much he wants external success and change to make him happy. He knows that it has to come from within, but he's afraid of that. So much more could be said on Bojack, but to summarize, <laughs> Bojack is anything but a lovable character. He manipulates, destroys, is selfish, drags him and people around him down. His problem is that part of him knows the solution to his problems. He needs to face himself, he needs to change. While he gets closer and closer to that every subsequent season and even puts himself into rehab at the end of season five, he's afraid that such a self-reflection will result in the realization that this is all he is. There is no better in him because he's not a better person. Therefore, he looks for an external solution. Love interest, a new movie, his autobiography. But either the external solution is brought to a close or it fails, and what always remains is that he's not happy. He hits rock bottom, gets drunk, goes on a drug bender, hits himself violently, and the whole thing repeats itself. Every season it seems that Bojack is getting close to being a better person, but he always fails. In season three this becomes explicitly evident. During the promotion of For the Oscars, he sleeps with the only person that his housemate Todd ever had feelings for. For Todd, we have slipped through many manipulations and insults from Bojack. This is a breaking point. Todd, I'm sorry, all right? I screwed up. I, I know I screwed up. I don't oh, know right, I... of course. Here it comes. You can't keep doing this. You can't keep doing shit things and then feel bad about yourself like that makes it okay. You need to be better. I know, and I'm sorry, okay? I was drunk and there was all this pressure with the Oscar campaign, but now, now that it's over, I, I know. No, no, Bojack, just stop. You are all the things that are wrong with you. It's not the alcohol or the drugs or any of the shitty things that happened to you in your career or when you were a kid, it's you. All right? It's you. Fuck, man. What else is there to say? Well, that's a rather depressing point to end on, but that is Bojack Horseman for you. And while I had to cut all the analysis of anxiety and nihilism, that would I followed, because of the time, and I'd like to talk too long, I couldn't bring myself to cut this wonderful quote. You know, sometimes I feel I was born with a leak, and any goodness I started out with slowly spilled out of me, and now it's all gone, and I will never get it back in me. Life is a series of closing door, isn't this? Isn't it? Now, as I just mentioned, and to give a brief outlook, with some more time I would have extended my argumentation to link cynicism and nihilism via the Kierkegaardian concept of anxiety. However, I hope you grab me one very quick notion on nihilism. Friedrich Nietzsche understands nihilism as the condition of institutions losing their reason. Bojack Horseman shows us many examples of that. For example, in the first season, a drunk Bojack steals the D of the Hollywood sign as a gift for Diana, uh, Diane, and for the rest of the show, it is just called Hollywood. No one questions it, everyone just goes along with it. Or remember Bojack's Golden Club Award for his autobiography. Now, is there any hope for Bojack? Well, I don't want to spoil this great series for anyone, so I won't answer this question. But there are many more moments in this series that scream for analysis. The penultimate episode alone would be worth an article. Now, I want to end with a question that I have been unable to answer yet. Is the show only full of cynicism because we, the viewers, have a cynical perspective? Thank you for your attention. Yosha, and I'm so happy the sound worked, because if we had to act that out, it would have probably taken a while. Um, so now we have about 15 minutes for questions at least, maybe a little bit if there's, you know, uh, more questions, more interesting comments, and we have this wonderful box I'm happy to bring around, or you project like I try to do. Um, yeah, or I can throw it. I don't know, heads up. I mean, 
Um, for anybody in the panel, or for all of them together, if you can link it together, you know. Um, so, any questions? Burning? Not burning. <laughs> the actual question is for Sean. Um, so um, you, you, you were talking about the kind of aesthetic parallels between, say, Liefenstahl and um, the Tenman films, right? Um, but in some ways, uh, the aesthetic parallels between socialist realist art and fascist art are kind of well established already, right? In, in uh, say, in regard to, to statue, to sculpture, and so on and so on. Um, so two full questions. What do you think accounts for that? Why are they so similar? Is it just a historical conditioning? And B, what would a fully socialist art, in the good sense, in the non-GDR sense, which was a terrible country, um, look like? Um, Sorry, big question. Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, because there is this affinity, and especially in this like, kind of great man sense that there is often, and even, yeah, you think of, of like a Soviet propaganda poster or a GDR propaganda poster, and there there does end up being this affinity. And um, I don't know precisely why that is. I think part of it for me, and this being me, um, I think there's there's an affinity in both wanting to work towards forms of realism, mm -hmm. um, a, an appeal in a sense to to art which which doesn't necessarily question the, the status quo of art or of society. Um, you know, I think of the, the degenerate art exhibition in, in Munich and the Nazis displaying the avant-garde and abstract art and modern art as negative in some way. Um, and, and I think we can see those same sorts of, of strains happening in, in socialist production. For what is good art and in, you know, or, or good socialist art, um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think for film, like I think of Eisenstein, I think Eisenstein does sort of invoke some of these mass schema, but in a way which is trying to mirror um, Marxist dialectics and thinking about the, the way in which humans sort of operate within these structures. So it tries to show us the structure rather than um, to glorify like singular individuals. Um, something like Elizitsky as well, which, which tries to be didactic, which tries to question what is a book, what is what, what, what materiality does art have. So I think for me that it, it comes back to, to modes of art which try to really question those structures in the first place um, because I think that's at the heart of like what Marxist analysis is trying to do, should be doing, is, is questioning these structures and if you're not questioning that, then you end up in these places where you're, you're venerating and mythologizing individuals and, and not actually pushing past those. Very good. Anybody else? I wanted to ask Caroline about your talk, and I, I have to apologize. I walked in a little late, and so I missed the first part, and so maybe my question is kind of mute, and you've already spoken to me, and then maybe in that case you can just repeat what you already said, but I was curious uh, if you had um, addressed uh, how the Pif Kasata fits into a whole, you know, a whole canon, I would say, of anti-Heimat literature in, in Austria, and um, which, which I find really interesting and ironic because it, of course, rests, that, that whole lit literature rests on this paradox where the, the self-loathing of the Austrian, you know, for whatever reasons, patriarchy, Catholicism, you know, whatever it is, the self-loathing of the Austrian uh, is so ubiquitous that it, of course, folds the person who loathes it in, and he becomes himself so inherently Austrian precisely by trying to distance it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I was wondering if if you could speak a little bit to how how that the Pika saga also fits into that and how how that structure itself is deeply ironic and if there's sort of an, an awareness of being part of that tradition in the, in that um, um, Pika saga, which I understand is that a, a, a TV series or film? Yeah, it was a script that has put, been put into a film. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's very interesting because I. 
I grew up with the term Piefke, and I used it for Germans, and it's still it's still there in Austria, and it's that form of um, being racism that is still accepted in society. Uh, whereas if we are talking about people from other countries, you know, so like in public, it's not accepted anymore, or widely not con um, accepted to um, use derogatory terms, but the word Piefke and everything that is anti-German is still there. Like you will find for the um, World Cup, you would find we are fans of Austria and all the other countries that uh, beat Germany. Um, and so when I investigated the Piefke saga a little more, because every time you watch the movie, you, you find little details that are so outstanding. I actually realized what, what I was doing when I was a child. Like, it's a whole society that is anti-German, and it's still the case, I would say. Um, if you meet people abroad, you would say, oh, the Germans are everywhere, everywhere. And it's, it's so socially accepted that it's actually super frightening. So this is still there. And, and we have this, um, there's no awareness from people that what people are doing is wrong, I would say. Um, I can even remember that one of my teachers has used one of those things when I was in, in secondary school. So um, the history of this term and the history of Austria and Germany, it has been so difficult and so complex. And then this idea of like um, stepping back from this nationalism is still so much in, in, in the social memory, I would say, or the, like the, um, uh, what's it called, the collective memory, um, that it's still there and it's not questioned. Does that answer your question? <clears throat> yeah, uh, it does. But um, but do you see? So I guess another way to ask the question is like, what is the relationship between uh, hating Germans and hating loathing Germans versus loathing self-loathing as an Austrian? Is the is the is the is the is the you know in this in this film the way this performed here is this. Is this hating the German also this point back to sort of a self loathing? Um, I'm not so sure. I, I don't think it it is because um, after World War II, Austria has had this collective idea of we are the victims, and it's not so much about uh, hating itself because there are still people who think that we were the first victims. And it was a whole long process uh, with the Waldheim affair in the in the 80s and stuff where um, that has come up and brought up again. So I don't think it reflects back that Austria, this, what you were saying, it's more really this anti-German, but knowing that we need the Germans for tourists. It's like this ambivalent um, relationship that there is and still exists up until today. for Yosha. Hi, Yosha, thank you for your cogently argued paper about something I know absolutely <laughs> nothing about. But I was struck by the almost absolute sense of hopelessness uh, mm -hmm. in, in this Bojack Horseman, but yet it's, it's funny. And so I just wondered, could you talk a little bit more about the role of humor in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this supposedly hopeless uh, series and if that humor is constantly undermining this, ab this seeming absolute mm -hmm. uh, sense of, of nihilism or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, to one degree, I'm, I mean, I definitely understand the kind of hopelessness, how they can look like this. And I think if you watch it, you can probably also, also think it. Although I do think that with the different characters that you have, and even with Bojack at times, it's not always like totally hopeless. Like maybe the characters think it is totally hopeless, but I don't think the show ever really takes on the tone like something is absolutely hopeless. Um, but I think when it comes to the humor, it's it's interesting because I think on to one on one degree or on one hand we have the humor just kind of like at the side where it's kind of they run both on the kind of parallel path, so to say, um, where it's like yeah we have this this miser misery and all these things and these really hard topics. But at the same time, we have the humor. We can see that, for example, in the one clip where we have this really emotional scene 
um, kind of almost haunting, where he just doesn't answer him and it's silent for like 10 seconds. And then we have this humorous thing coming in again. And we have all these animal puns that often are really just in the back, that you don't even, that are not even like put right for you. You really need to look for them or maybe be really attentive. Um, so I think there's definitely one part of the humor that's really just there for humor's sake. Um, but I do think that the biggest part of the humor is maybe not necessarily undercutting it, but I think maybe kind of distancing it a little bit in so far as it makes it easier to, um, at least I think in, in, the, in the, the first, if you watch it first, I think it makes it easier to take all of this in. But I feel the more you think about it, and the more they repeat certain things, I think even with the humor, the more it kind of um, hits you. And I also think it just shows that people who are going through things, who are depressed and things like that, it doesn't mean that they're 24-7 just Debbie Downers, that they also can be humorous, and that maybe situations that they're in are humorous, but that the situations that they're in are humorous, but can at the same time also be really um, sad or really depressing. And the show also really shows us really well because we have episodes where we don't just see Bojack as our protagonist, but where he's actually in the background and we have the other characters kind of to show how Bojack, for whom this might be almost funny, or maybe even a little bit depressing, or maybe doesn't really care about it, how this affects these characters. Um, and there it kind of shows that it's also subjective to a degree. So and that's where, where it is kind of, it can be both depressing and, and funny at the same time, which is where this one quote is coming from, that it can be both miserable and funny at the same time. For all of you guys, this, they were great, by the way, so it's really cool to listen. Um, in all of them, I noticed this theme, what we talked about self-loathing or mm -hmm. loathing of other. Um, it made me think of the idea of splitting from Slaughter Lake and versus mm -hmm. embodiment, so how cynicism is like this split between um, two things. And um, also the like the different characters seeking visibility, I think you brought up that word, um, or seeking social recognition. And it makes me think of like film or TV itself and uh, fiction specifically. And so I'm wondering if fiction, because it's not true, functions as a, a split, or if you guys have any insight if fiction is inherently cynical because it's not true. Or it like splits, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think, it's a, I think it's, that's a fascinating question. Because I mean, if, if, if we just say yes to that, that really means that we just kind of re revamp fiction and so far that everything is cynical. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure, because I, cause I mean, you, for example, showed in the, in the beginning that some of the movies that you said they were really uncynical, and then later it kind of evolved. Um, I think it, I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna, well, A, I think you probably have to kind of make an argument about what is real, is true and so on and so forth, so we probably have to go in this direction first to kind of make the argument that what we have here is kind of real and that fiction there isn't real. Um, but if you want to make that argument, um, I want to say you could probably make that hypothesis if you want to, but I don't just want to say yes because I would have to think about it a lot more. But it's a good question. You can provide nuanced answers too. <laughs> yes yeah, um, no, I think it's really, I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it. Um, and I think, I, yeah, I think it's interesting, especially, but what, I, what, what am I saying? Um, I think part of what makes it what makes it interesting to talk about fiction, film, et cetera, is that there is this like split from reality. So I think in part, like as you say, it something about fiction is not true. Um, so there's always going to be that distinction, but I think that also invites the, the opportunity or the possibility to speak to truth in a way that isn't beholden to like the exact mechanical truth of the world. So as, as Yosha said, that we can ask like what's real, what's not, thinking about Bojack, like yes, there is no horseman, um, <laughs> but that there is, <laughs> that would be great. But there is no, but there is depression. There is, um, I, and I, again, as he said, there is the possibility of humor together with depression or um, 
you know, a, a film critic criticizing a political structure or political ideology is speaking to something true. So I don't know if that actually answers your question, but that's just kind of where it where it takes me in, in terms of the the separation from reality perhaps gives it the opportunity to to speak to reality in a way that you couldn't if you're beholden to exactly what's what's actually happening in the world. Okay. Maybe to the Pivka saga, um, if I connect it to that, the the four parts of the of the Pivka saga, it was a huge scandal, not because it was not real, but because the tourism industry said well, we cannot show that in public because there will not be any tourists anymore. So they were actually arguing that it is too real, and especially like one, the part one to three, and then part number four was prohibited um, in, in TV channels, and so it was first, um, I think, published in, in the 2000s, so like, like 10 to 15 years later on. So it was too real. Um, and so I find it interesting because in, in that sense when you say it splits, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know. I wonder if fiction then is like a form of censorship. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? We can go a couple minutes over and let everybody growl in some already. <laughs> that was a good question, but that is nobody else. I, just, I was curious, Yasha, if you could translate your talk into a German pop culture context. Uh, it, it, I, it, I, I don't know, uh, you know, German cartoon TV parody shows at all, but I was wondering if there is something that does a similar thing, or somebody's trying to do this, you know, the way that the, the, the late late night shows and all that is sort of yeah. translated into a into a German version. Yeah. There's definitely, it's, it's for me, it's a very American form of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of comedy, and and would how would that look, or does that exist in Germany? Yeah. Or, or, or if not. What, what is sort of, what, is, what would be missed in translation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really super well versed on German TV as well. And I, off my head, I don't know any like cartoon anime kind of series where we would find both the animation style and maybe topics like that. But I think um, you would find similar ideas. Like, again, Ojek was just an example. As you said, in late night shows, I think that's very prevalent, the cynicism in there. And late night shows have kind of been uh, getting popular in Germany as well. Um, with the uh, Heute Show, we have, um, what's his name, uh, Jan Böhmermann, and so on. We have Joko and Klaas. And I'm, I could imagine that you could probably make a similar argument, although I think it might be helpful if you want to make that argument to start in the US and look at late night shows there, and then maybe kind of bring it over or something like that. Um, but just out of, but, I mean, that's pretty much I, the only German TV I know anyway, or to show Jan Böhmermann. Um, so I don't know much more uh, when it comes to German TV. But I think for the, these late night shows, things, I think you can definitely make the argument. Yeah. How about the Kangaroo Chroniken? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, Mark Uwe Kling, Kangaroo Chroniken, mm -hmm. and also uh, his newest... Um, what about the name now? Um, well, his newest novel as well. That was that came out last year. I want to say, yeah, he would definitely be an author that you could uh, look at that. And then Kangaroo Koikun was coming, I think, into the cinema as well. So it would also be a, as a as a as a movie. So yeah, that's that's definitely another I think another example. Yeah. All the way in the back. I mean, I, I think you, you make, I think I'm with you on the point that 
you can't just say Bojack doesn't uh, is not true because you would probably have to say something like if it exists then it's true and I mean it exists we can watch it as you just said um, and I I mean I mentioned Nietzsche a little bit when it comes to the, the little nihilism part that I that I had in there um, and to be honest it's pretty much kind of where my Nietzsche goes for, at the moment um, so I don't want to make any any claims about Nietzsche that are probably wrong but just Generally, if I understand, the question is, is Bojack Horseman true, or is that the question? Because then I would just say yes. I think that's, that's the answer that I can give you. Because again, I, mean, you, you, I think you pretty much answered the question yourself. Because um, not just the topics are true, um, you could probably also say, well, they have voice actors, so the voices are real, because the people that voice them exist, they're human beings. But again, it's, it's something that we can watch, that we can consume. Um, we could potentially buy it as a, as a Blu-ray or whatever, um, have like a physical copy of it, and I think those are, could probably also always argue those makes it make it true. Um, and it's a story that you can that you can follow along, and I think those are all things that, that make it true. Yeah. If that kind of answers what you were hoping to hear. I just want to hear your account of truth because I'm not sure. My, my, my kind of truth of, of about Bojek, or just generally? Well, you know, I don't want to get too personal. It just sounds like you want to say more about truth, and I want to give you space to um, Well, if, if I have to say my truth, then, I, then my truth would be I hope that there are many, many more shows like Bojek, because I think it's, it's an absolutely fantastic way to talk about these kind of, um, these kind of topics, and also with a sincerity. And again, I've shown things like if you're depressed, again, you're not this stereotype that people usually have in your mind, but that, and also that life is not just one single emotion, that many different things can happen at the same time. You can be depressed and maybe then crack a choke and be humorous at the same time. All the, those things can happen together because, I mean, we're human beings, we're not one dimensional. And I think that would be my truth, and I think that's what I consider the most truthful, the most important in Bojack Horseman. And um, so you um, all talk about cynicism in, in like movie films from very different times. So I was wondering if um, if you see like a development of the representation of cynicism in in um, fiction as like in movies, and if you do, what do you think the reason for these changes are, especially going back to this representation of mm -hmm. our mindset in the twenty first century and stuff. I mean, again, I think I have to say something like I, I'm, I don't watch enough movies and shows to see a development, but if there is one, which I imagine there might be one, I think it is, A, because I feel that many movies and shows have become more self-reflective, I think, um, and openly more self-reflective, that they bring self-reflection and things like that into the show, into the movie, maybe breaking the fourth wall, things like that. And another thing I think that might, might help with kind of evolving and making it at least more overt is probably the internet, that you have kind of this immediate feedback, um, that you can go on Twitter and post your opinion on Bojack, you can write 10 different blog entries if you want, you can send them an email, all these things, so they also have immediate feedback. And then you can, I don't know, bring fans into the show, which happened with Bojack, that some of the voice actors are fans, things like that. Um, that might be a reason why there's an evolution, if there's an evolution, which I don't want to say yes to, because I don't know that. Um, and I, I think I would add, so I agree, and I don't want to speak too broadly, but I think I would also add that we can maybe look at, um, and not just in, in film, but since, since that's the topic of discussion, the, the evolution of even just like the material condition of making film and making TV shows that has kind of exploded, especially recently, in that there are fewer and fewer barriers to entry, um, especially when we just think, if, if we like broaden out from what is and isn't a film and avoid that discussion, but just like to visual media, um, you know, with your phone, you can make something and put it on YouTube, and there are actually some like short films made entirely with iPhones that really stand up and are interesting. So I think it may to some extent be a reflection of that fact that there's, there's less institutional apparatus to impose itself on the film. 
as opposed to, you know, in, in the silent film era or in the 50s where you kind of needed a studio. That on, on some level you needed this institutional apparatus through which you could produce a film, which in Hollywood or in socialist states or wherever, there's always going to be some sort of oversight, some sort of censorship coming in, even if it's as simple as a producer saying, like, this scene won't play, so let's cut it. So I think maybe there's more room for individual expression in visual media now than there were. But again, that's very that's a very sweeping statement. So like I would, I would preface that and caveat that and disclaim that with, with um, the possibility that I'm entirely wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to make such sweeping sweeping claims over time. But that's like the thing that comes to my mind. I think that when it comes down to film, we always need to look at the specific era in which it has been produced. And so already in this form, it has changed a lot because expressionist film, of course, had its form of cynicism and irony, but it, it also has to be seen embedded in that historical area. And so throughout the past century, maybe when, when a film was very popular, of course, the depiction has changed as well, simply for the fact that the historic area has developed as well. Any more <coughs> pressing or not pressing questions? <laughs> Last question, I would say, yeah. Yes, I really like this version of your talk. I read and listened to it before, and while I was listening, I was thinking, well, what is I mean, I mean, I again, I could imagine that that might be the case, but that would be something that yeah. I would have to do a lot more research in. But I, I think um, why I think that might be the case is just again because the show is much more self-reflexive than I think any Pixar movie will ever be, probably. Yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so thank you very much.